We move live show. Uh, we kind of started five minutes ago, and I have the feeling actually this yeah. is going to be a good conversation today. Oh yeah, it's already been a good conversation. <laughs> Sorry, you all. We didn't mean to leave you on that first part, but <laughs> we could have run away with it. Totally. <laughs> um, so Ashley, who is our very special guest today? Yes, we have Harry Aikens Arite, um, who is on the show from Great Britain. I think it's 10 p.m. where you are, Harry. You Man, are... thanks for staying up late. Yeah, I am le I'm up late. I am, to be fair, I said this already, but I'm a bit of a night owl, and I couldn't really, you know, turn down the opportunity to chat to you guys. And uh, yeah, no, I'm excited for it. If anything, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just here, ready, you know? Yes, we're so happy you're on the show. Um, for those of you who don't know Harry, um, you have been an all-star runner for most of your life. Um, you won two gold me medals as a youth athlete in the 100 and 200, 200 World Youth Championships. Um, you are a two-time Olympian and um, World European and Commonwealth Games medalist. So you all, in short, Harry is fast. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and outside of running, you think you're a chef, which I'm using your words for that. So we'll circle back on that later. Um, yeah, it. so we're excited to chat with you today. Yeah, no, I appreciate you for having me on, guys. I mean, yeah, as you just said, I've, I've been in track and field for a while. Um, it's obviously been a love of mine. I've, I'm 31 now. Um, um, you mentioned a few accolades that I had done back in 2005. I won the World Youth. So I've been around for a while. Um, having to take care of my body and keep motivation and energy levels going has been part of the journey. But, you know, I get to, you know, chat to guys like you about it all. So I'm excited for it. Yeah, we are so excited to get into all that and more. Uh, quick reminder, guys, this whole thing is made possible by the Together We Move collaborative that uh, actually we've been working on for seven weeks now. I know. Can it's you believe that? It's a long time. We put in workouts. It's like an own endurance event, continuing to put in new workouts each and every day. <laughs> and we've had some incredible guests along the way contribute those guest workouts. Of course, you can find all those and more in the Run Experience app as well as Fleet Feet's YouTube channel and website. If you guys haven't subscribed to Fleet Feet's YouTube website, YouTube website, YouTube channel, go ahead yeah. <laughs> and get on that right now. Um, and also today um, on the show, we're doing a really awesome giveaway. We are giving away to two lucky winners. You must be present to win a pair of New Balance 880s. They're a cult classic shoe, one of my faves, and a year long subscription to the Run Experiences training app. Yeah, we're very excited about that. We thought about, you know, Harry wanted to throw in some track spikes, but we weren't sure if y'all <laughs> were really going to be down for that or not. Maybe <laughs> after this conversation, you'll change your mind. We'll see. Okay. Hopefully, <laughs> yeah. But if you guys can <laughs> find that, uh, oh, oh yeah, I was gonna say the description link to make sure we know where to get in. I'm already reading your mind, Ashley. Is gonna be down in the description below this video. You can enter the giveaway. You have to be present. We are gonna do that drawing in about 45 minutes. Yeah. And speaking of daily workouts, um, Harry, you've been posting workouts on your Instagram channel as well, almost every day. I think, right during this time. Yeah. So. Um... Do you know what it is? As as obviously there is a global pandemic and, you know, it's I find what you have to be as you have to be honest to yourself and you have to be. Um, yeah, I find in this opportunity for a lot of people, you should try and understand yourself more so and what makes you, you know, tick. And obviously I'm a professional athlete. Um, I was gearing up for Tokyo and I'm getting ready for it. But all of a sudden, um, you know, we're unable to sort of do what we need to do to get ready for an Olympic Games because obviously it's been moved now. So waking up on a daily motivation and things, and we'll touch on that in a bit, but I was finding, I was thinking to myself, I want to have that fun factor back to my mm. training. You know, it is a social sport. And I also wanted to give back to people to show that it's not, you don't just have to work out in one way. Um, so yeah, I've, I've gone to Instagram and doing like a few live workouts or giving some workouts out to do. And like, if you've even been more like plyometric based and a lot mm -hmm. of people are like, wow, I didn't realize that just moving in this way can help me burn calories and feel fit and start my day with such positive energy. And, you know, for me, I'm a show off. I'm a showman. I like to, if you put a camera in front of me, I'm going to train that much harder. If I've got an audience, I'm going to perform that much better. So if anything, it's an additional part to my training. So a lot of people actually helping me more than they know. Mm -hmm. That's cool. You it's know, I, I was going to just say, I just... Uh, fellow showman over here with the whole YouTube channel. 
Uh, I <laughs> I totally felt that when I did uh, my own virtual 5K. Harry, I ran a virtual 5K race through my neighborhood, which on the paper sounds terrible thing to do and not to do it. <laughs> but it was super fun, and because I filmed it, I was like, I can't slow down. Everyone's well, it just it kept me in it. So uh, I totally feel the the give and take and the energy. Zach, yeah, yeah. you have to do it for the you have to do it for the audience for sure. You've got to perform for the audience. You've got to show them the best technique. You've got to keep that vibe going. You've got, and it's so easy to just sort of do things, you know, 80%, 90%. And, you know, and, and we've got to be honest. We're not, we're not perfect. And the more honest or, or transparent you can be with yourself, then you'll find ways to, to keep that fire burning and to keep that energy moving and to keep feeling better about yourself because there's no reason to sit there and say, oh, I wish I could be doing this and I wish I could be feeling this way. And so, you know, all of these types of workouts will definitely help us in a positive sense. Yeah. Okay, so I had a question for you that was farther down in the script, but because we're talking about this, I'm going to bring it up right now. Um, and that is like... You talked about Tokyo, you know, that goal shifted, all of this sort of transition during this period. And you've moved to do these workouts on Instagram. You're helping to inspire people. It's helping you as well. And like, what sort of goal do you see now for yourself? Like there's this uncertain future ahead. Like when are races coming back? They've all been canceled for the near future. But so what does that look like? And, and what have you learned about yourself during all of this? Oh my gosh, it's, 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 it's a bit crazy because, you know, when you're sort of living in a movie, you know, you don't, it doesn't feel, when you think back to moments in time, you go, wow, we really did that or that really happened. And yeah. this is one of those times. And I, I'm, I'm using this as an opportunity to um, just find myself in a way that I, I didn't have time to do before. So understanding what makes me drive and what makes me go and, to, to really sit and think, okay, well, no Olympics is happening, but how does that make me feel? Mm. And obviously, I is still there. So, of course, I'm going to be doing everything that I want to do uh, to, to make sure that I'm in the best position to get there next year. Now, with no races or races being cancelled every... Mm. I, my agent will tell me suddenly that, you know, this is the schedule, then it moves back, then it moves mm. back. And for things like that, you don't know. So, you've just got to keep a fluid mentality a fluid mindset and I always find that I, I like to think I'm quite an energetic positive person so I always ask myself at the end of the day have I laughed enough you know like mm -hmm. have I done enough to make myself smile and if I haven't I'll pick up my PlayStation controller and play some FIFA or I'll make myself well, some waffles ice cream this time in period that we should all still be being positive as much as there is some uncertainty to, for people and um, unfortunate circumstances for a lot we still have to live our lives to the fullest because it's a gift. So mm. I always just sit there and say, have I laughed enough? If not, I'm going to do something to make myself happy and smile. So each day has been fluid like that. And as for goal setting, um, for example, I'm, I'm transitioning. Um, I've decided that I want to change aspects of my house. I've been doing a lot of DIY mm. um, in, in touch uh, with, uh, you know, decking out my garage to turn it into a proper gym. Um, again, for su supplementing something that is a loss. So I can train in what I would regard as some form of high performance to keep that going, because that is also something that drives me walking into a place that makes me feel like I want to train. So mm -hmm. I've got to facilitate that for myself. And I mean, you guys might be able to relate. It's, it's one of those things that when you have a passion for something and things change, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's nice to know that you still want it that much more that you're going to do what you can to get there. So that's sort of where I'm at right now, just keeping it fluid, staying positive and I wouldn't say using this opportunity to do anything that I haven't done, mm. but more so opportunity to, you know, understand myself and others around me because we can only connect with people via, you know, you know, video calls and phone calls. So it is a great way to reconnect with a lot of people differently. Yeah. It, God, that's so good. <laughs> it really is. I wanted to ask just a follow up on the Olympics. So, so you've been to two Olympic Games, correct? Yeah. I went to, uh, I was in Beijing in 08. Um, I was selected or going to be selected for London. But I tore my hamstring two weeks before, oh. which was, uh, no, um, three, four weeks before, which was upsetting, but we moved. And um, then I went to Rio in 2016. Wow. So you, so you have a lot of experience. And I imagine one of the more senior members on your team, especially at this point, 
does it feel at this stage where you're like, oh, like I've missed my last opportunity to potentially make an Olympic team? Or is it, oh, you know what? I've been to two already. I'm good. I know, I know what you're saying. So I when all of this, um, the pandemic with Corona virus started to creep out and people were panicking about the season, I was talking to one athlete on the track and I could see she was so stressed. And I'm diverting a little bit. I'll come back. Don't worry. And I said to her, like, what's up? And she was like, Harry, like, I just want it so much. Like, this, like, I'm old, I'm older because, mm. you know, she's the late bloomer. And this is one of my only opportunities. Like, I feel that this is the best time I could be an Olympian. And I was like, look, you PB'd last year. You PR'd last year. You you made the world team. You've been part mm. of the team up for the last two years. There's no way that you're all of a sudden not going to be in a great opportunity or great position next year if you continue on the curvature that you are. So no matter like the drive that you have. So when you say I've been to two, yeah, I've been to two, but I've not got a medal. So for me, mm-hmm. that's the only medal from my actual cat- catalogue of things. And I said to her, just relax, like you're going to be in that position. And that's my mentality. I'm going to be in that same position. I, I was part of the world team last year for the relay. Obviously, I went to Rio. But I was also part of the European gold medal winning team in the 4x1 in 2018 and the Commonwealth. So I'm there. I'm in the mix. and I'm going to put myself in the best position to do so. Mm. And I'm a medal because that's the only thing that I'm missing. And, you know, to a lot of people that don't understand track, great, you've got a medal at Worlds, Commonwealth Europeans, but oh, but have you got an Olympic medal? You know, mm. some people water like so easy to get, but I want to turn around and say, yeah, I got one. So it's one of those things I'm still looking forward to. And it's um, it's like... It's like you sit there and you think each one means something different. And where I've been successful as a junior, successful in my early years, you, you become reluctant to enjoy those victories and enjoy those moments. So I remember winning a European gold medal in the 4x1 in 2014. Um, and I celebrated that with my teammates. Like, yeah, it was nothing. Um, mm. 2018... Oh my gosh, I made sure I took it all in. I was just like, you know, you never know when you're going to be here again. You never know what's going on. So I literally, like, that lap of honour, I was like, I was taking it in so slowly. To, and, you know, whereas before it's like, yeah, I've got a, I've got a competition next week, so let me go cool down. But So at this moment in time, I want to make sure that I'm at uh, Tokyo next year, 2021, and I'm going to put myself in the best position to take it all in because, mm. you know, that potentially be my last Olympics. But then again... We see how our body feels. We see where we are on the global scale of competition. Sure. Am I still on the team? I might be there for 2024. We never know. Yeah. Yeah. And when it comes to sprinting, um, I, I've heard you say this, I think, in one of your videos about how, like, it's hard to, like, it's really hard to nail it. But when you nail it, it's just like this amazing feeling and this beautiful thing because I would say in some ways sprinting really exposes your weaknesses. Like Mm -hmm. if everything isn't fine tuned and perfectly in line, it's like, you know, it's just such a small amount of difference in like the perfect day and the just not so great day. So like, how would you describe that perfect, perfectly executed race? And like, what does that feel like? The worst way to describe it (laughs) is... The worst way to describe it is it's a blur. You Mm. literally yourself in a place of just things just happen automatically. And that's what it Mm. is. When you're the thing that you have to start off with is confidence. When Mm. you know that you're in a place, then all of a sudden everything feels easier. Everything just happens. Now, because the reason why we do, you know, repeat blocks to 10 to 20 to 30 meters The reason why, you know, you might even do repeat blocks to fly and just working on your set position. Because all of these things, you're you're, you're slowly, you know, um, giving yourself an opportunity and you're adding muscle memory and you're allowing your body to go through that autopilot process so that, you know, when it comes to fight or flight, your body just reacts naturally. You know, the only way I can describe it is, you know, in situations where you fall over in a race, you know, whether it be a distance race or whatever, if you just fall over in a situation, you just get back up and carry on going. No one tells you to just, you go, whoa, whoa, whoa. you know, you just carry on going. There's times where you might stumble in a race coming out of the blocks, but you learn to compensate. The body's a great tool in terms of figuring things out for itself. And then you find yourself back in the race. Mm. So when you're talking perfect race, as bad as it sounds, it's a blur because you just find yourself, especially through those first, 40 meters 
you find that reaction, bang, the gun goes in. I would say you just awaken, you will, you become mm. woke at in and around 40 to 50 meters as you come through that transition. And Good that's where <laughs> yeah, you, you, you give that opportunity to then your brain comes involved. That's when your brain is switched on. It's, do I relax? Do I carry on going? Do I chase that guy down mm. because someone might be ahead of you? Do I need to think about running away? Do I relax? And that half the time, a lot of a athletes, you're a duck on water. You know how ducks just move around, but underneath their legs are going mental. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes sprinters, we'd be looking the most easiest because a relaxed muscle is a fast muscle. A relaxed mm. muscle is a reactive, strong muscle. Mm. I'm a built guy. So if I tense up and I'm restricting my movement, I'm going backwards. Whereas if I relax and allow myself to flow through the gears, but keep that intensity, and that's a fine line. So as you go through that first 30 meters, it's a blur, but gun goes boom. And then you suddenly awaken. And then it's just how you take that situation. For me personally, I feel like I'm just floating on water. So I, for my perfect race, I just feel like I'm hot stepping. Like the floor mm -hmm. is lava. I'm literally like, bah, 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 bah. and I'm just there enjoying the feel and the movement and driving forward. That's, that's the only best way I could describe it. You, you don't feel tired. You just feel like your front side mechanics are a large part of that as you come out of that transition. Mm. But when you're behind and come through, again, sometimes there's an even greater feeling as you run past someone because, you know, you, you sort of keep that technique and keep the mechanics and keep everything flowing through. So that target helps you transcend yourself sometimes past where you might have been comfortably. So mm -hmm. it's always good to be in different types of scenarios. Yeah. You know, I want to, there's a few threads we're going to pull on. Actually, you and I were just talking about this like concept of relaxed versus tight, which I want to get to in a second. But we were going we're gonna to ask about like how sprinters break down a race because with, with distance runners, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's longer and they, they break it into sections, you know, potentially like, okay, I want to go out fast, but then settle into my pace need to look around. I want to make sure I survive. I mean, a lot of times, depending on the distance, if you're like Ashley and you're running hundred miles, you're like, I just don't want to die <laughs> for this whole <laughs> distance. Uh, and then, and then at the end you're like, well, I need to save something for the end. Is it the same in a hundred meter race? Just very, very compressed. So the way that you would break it down is more so like the first three steps. When you do hear the gun go, there is an essence of one, two, three, one, two, three. You want to get those feet down quickly. But again, it's, it's balance. Everything is about balance. The same way that you're talking about you don't want to go out too hard, but then at the same time, you don't necessarily want to go out too slow. We need to obviously move quickly and fast, but then we also need our stride length to cover ground. So mm -hmm. I can get my feet down quickly, but if I'm not covering ground, mm -hmm. then I'm going to take too many steps. And it just depends. You might have a high frequency, which means your legs turn over quicker, or you might have a bigger stride length. Now, in an ideal world, that's one of the reasons why Usain Bolt was so amazing. He had a massive stride length. So I think his peak stride length was in around 260 to 270 meters. That was one stride. Mine, my, my ideal stride length is in around 225 to 235. But my frequency, so how many steps I'm taking per mm. second, is five hertz. So five steps in around that. So someone oh. might be 4.8. But Bolt was in around five. So that's the reason why he was. So even though he might be just off someone's frequency, whereas Christian Coleman, who's a current world champion, his frequency is crazy. So he's turning over. But you've got to be fit to do that. Mm -hmm. So you've got to look at your model and how you would approach that and how you would train. So once you've done all that, <laughs> mm. then how you would break down 100 meters. And then you know exactly you know where you want to be stepping. So I always, you always have the three sections, your dry phase you obviously have you know your mid phase where it's your transition and then you have your flight phase so obviously how you finish the race now everyone in 100 meters in a sprint is slowing down even though you saw Usain Bolt running past people mm -hmm. he might hit his peak speed a little bit later most people hit their peak speed speed before 60 meters mm. now after 60 meters everyone is slowing down mm -hmm. it's, it's it's impossible not to slow down however the best thing to do is try to stop that speed from dropping so then it becomes mm. about speed then it goes back to being relaxed versus tight you tighten up you cause your speed curve to drop quicker because all of a sudden you're putting the brakes on things whereas if you can minimize it then it's it works better for you and when you see people running away or running past someone it's not that they're speeding up they're maintaining their speed mm. so a lot of that rhythm 
it has a lot to do with that transition because some people, if you don't shoot out the blocks properly and drive through that phase because it's energy expenditure as well, you can find yourself in an upright position earlier, mm -hmm. which then affects you later on in the race. Mm -hmm. There's so many ways that you can approach it. So I always like, for me personally, I need to work on my, uh, my 10 to 20 phase mm -hmm. because my phase is okay, but I tend to come through the race a little bit later because I then build a bit more momentum and I hit my top speed a little bit later in the race. Mm. So thinking about your perfect race, that's all you can do because some models might match up with different people Mm -hmm. And you can go as scientific as you want because there's, you know, there's different forms of technology out there. There's, there's the jump, which picks up on your stride length and your frequency and your flight time and whatever else. Or you can just train and see how you feel. Um, I would always recommend finding a balance between the two. Um, so when you're breaking down 100 meters, it is, you know, getting that big, strong push out the blocks and hitting the first three steps minimizing the amount of lag that you might have because you don't want to be on the floor for too long. And then through that, you want to carry on that feeling of pushing through the race. And as you transition through, there is an aspect of where you don't want to suddenly throw yourself up, but like an aeroplane, come up as if you're about to take off. And then you want to feel that force take you up. And you do want to slightly feel, like you mentioned earlier, actually, like your legs are trying to get away from you. You're trying to keep on your legs. You know, you want to feel like you're hot stepping and you're, uh, and then uh -huh. that, the best feelings you can have there's nothing worse than coming out of the transition and you just feel sluggish and you, yeah. your legs aren't fast and again that becomes all about the makeup of how you approach a race the type of planning that you have around it the recovery and the rest and it's basically how to make the best three course meal because it's not just about the dessert it's not just about the starter it's about everything that goes into it so there's different things that make the cake there's different things that mm -hmm. make this I love that. you know going on I just have to say, you painted such a good picture of the 100 meter race. Like, I'm, I'm okay. Like, yeah, I'm running it. Okay, I see it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> like, that was perfect. Uh, a, a relay is even more complicated. I'll add that. <laughs> <laughs> we won't get into handoffs today. Let's <laughs> maybe too much. <laughs> Literally. But no, it's, but this is something that I've always wondered. So, given that you guys would run a fair amount of mileage as you would say when you approach some form of race right i've always wondered this and i sometimes have this conversation with some of the athletes in the team and whatever else i always find it interesting that when someone knows that they can run a certain time in a distance race mm -hmm. you know when some people decide to play tactically versus running their best race what what makes that choice because i always find when i watch like the rounds mm. or the heat of a world championship and I think, why are these people playing tactical races when they could just go out and run? They know how to hit yeah. each lap or what pace they should be hitting. But some people like to play it tactically as opposed to just hitting it. So wh what? how do you find that sometimes in that mental approach? What sways that? You know, I, I think what's interesting is, especially with, with athletes that – aren't necessarily in their own lane, but they get to group together is that there is some energy saved when you're behind. And if you're like a cycling fan, you follow the tour, you know, drafting is significant on, on the bike, but it's even, it even helps with running. So you kind of get the sense of for athletes who are out there for a really long time, just the mental energy and expenditure of being out in front uh, is sometimes difficult. And then you see the athletes who, who wait for a while, at least, at least that's what I've, what I've seen. Yeah, I mean, I guess the other and the other piece of that, too, could be if there's like another round or something or you're you're OK, I have this race today and another distance race the next day or a, a, several hours later or something. And you're like you're trying to make it to a final round or something. So you're let me just conserve to get that without. Expanding. Yeah. yeah, that does. make, And that's I never thought of it in the sense of that mental fatigue of I'm out yeah. in front mm. and like. I've never thought of it in that sense. And one of my favorite events on the track, which you might be quite surprised to hear, is the 800 meters. Mm. I love. Oh, that that's race. such a cool. Yeah. That's it's like basically. the ultra marathon for sprinters. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it's, 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 the, it's a long sprint. It is just mm -hmm. a long sprint. And it reminds me of being young when, you know, whenever you used to do those sort of longer races, even when I ran the 200 when I was quite young, you'd sort of hold a bit of energy, wait to see who would kick first, and then they kick, so then you kick, and then. <laughs> I just love the way it tumbles. And my, um, when I won the World Juice when I was 16, 
Um, my first coach passed away when I was quite young as I sort of transitioned into a bit of elitist running. And um, my next coach was actually an 800 metre runner. So he, he was he didn't have a sprint background at all. He was just a very organised you know, person that worked for our federation. And he told me a lot about the 800. I've always had a bit of a soft spot for it. So I always find it interesting to hear people sort of what they think about people going through rounds and whatever else. Yeah. So we were actually going to ask, uh, man, there's so many directions I want to go with this, but I, know. I wanted to, we wanted to know like what the longest races you've competed in, uh, you know, potentially in the past. So race wise, the longest that I've actually competed in is a four by four relay. Um, if anyone had the pleasure of watching me in 2013 at the, uh, at, what was it, Tom Jones event in, in Florida, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, you would have been laughing yourself silly because um, for some odd reason they put me last leg and I collected the baton and I got hyped because all of a sudden there was one person just a little bit in front of me. So I decided to overtake him mm -hmm. and I felt silence like that before in my life because once i was out on the back straight as you said uh, as you said nathan there i was like i'm in front <laughs> I, have no, I have no idea what i'm doing why am i in front so i'm running down this back straight and then i got to about 150 to go and you know i could feel myself tightening up and i was thinking all right and the next thing you know one person went past me and with each person that went past me i just got slower and slower <laughs> But my grimacing, being the kind of guy I am, I wasn't grimacing like you would expect. I was ended, I just smiled. I, that was me <laughs> grimacing. I was smiling. People were saying, stop laughing, keep running. And I was telling you, I was my hardest. But I was just, you know. <laughs> I mean, so, they say if you smile when you're running, that, that relaxes your facial muscles and you maybe perform better. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> But that was an experience. and um, But in training, um, we will sort of up, up things a little bit. So uh, the furthest sort of rep that I will do in training, the furthest I've ever run has been like a 450. Um, other than that, a 350. But we will quite regularly run around 250, 300s, more, more so in our full training. Or we might hit a one-off 250, 300 in and around our sort of spring camp. Uh, training again just for building on that conditioning and lactic sort of speed endurance aspect of training so uh in the in the full training like i said we could do anything like 10 200s with two set two mm. minutes in between around 29 28 second pace um or we might drop it down to like five 250s in and around 28 29 second pace that's when we're you know picking things up but the uh, you know the recovery goes up to about seven eight minutes mm -hmm. um in the winter we could be doing that session at five minutes at 30 seconds but as the season progresses we then take a little more recovery and go a little bit faster um but those are the sort of distances that are quite regularly running training so it gets to a point which again men mental aspects about everything are key because i remember in the fall i'm always good mm. to if you ask me to run a 200 i'm happy is if i have to run a 250 300 so That's when I get to run, I'm happy. Then the moment I have an indoor season and focusing around 60 meters, the moment I then have to run a 200 or a 150, I'm actually quite scared again. In training, I get quite scared. But two months ago, I would have taken that every day of the week. So it's just that mental aspect, getting ready and getting used to certain things. So if you expose yourself enough to whatever distance you feel like you might need, you'll then get used to it. You just got to break the seal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I have one more question, and then maybe we should transition to some of our rapid fire rapid questions. Rapid fires, yeah, I like it. Yeah. So because you've talked a lot about this sort of idea of balance, we've gone mm. back and forth about all of that. Um, and in the way that you describe sprinting, like it really sounds like this dance between like all these different elements, and it's like this really well choreographed performance. It sounds like when it all is executed. Um, yeah. So when we talk about sprinting, like there's this really important element of strength and mm. having the right amount of strength. And then if we think about um, like muscle tension, allowing you to um, move quickly and what's the balance between that tension and flexibility specifically. Mm. And like, like how do you approach f flexibility? And then, you know, like if you're too flexible, do you feel like it slows you down or, and, and what is the balance? Like, how do you know you're there? It's a complicated so, question. So, the best way 
word that I would use, right, is you don't want to be stiff, yeah? You don't want the muscle to feel, because, uh, you know, if, if you have a muscle that is fairly immobile and stiff, mm. um, obviously where injuries will come. And then you don't want to be, uh, you know, hyper flexible because there's no tension or fast reactivity within the tissue. So if you can have an elastic muscle, hence the reason why a lot of sprinters, similar to your, you know, animals like cheetahs and, you know, like even if you look at a dog's tendon, they're all very high and very stringy. So that's one of the best ways to identify a sprinter by their calves because we have very high calves. So it's mm. all about elastic and reactive. So mm. although I might not be the most flexible, I'm flexible enough and have enough tension in my tissue for it to whip and snap in. So where you have an elastic muscle, it kind of goes beyond the point of comfortability in a certain sense, like our stride length, hamstring tissue. So you sort of, as, a, as the knee stride comes down, it snaps back. And so if there's that added bit of elasticity and reactivity in the tissue, that can then hit the track and give you that much more reactivity. Whereas if you're so flexible, it's going to stick out there and enjoy being out there because it knows it can be out there for a long mm. period of time. Whereas I'm not saying that you can't be mobile. Yeah. Being mobile and conditioned is different to mm. stupid flexibility within a tissue or tendon or however you might think about it. So it's one of those things that you just want to think of yourself as an elastic ball you've wound it up and then you ping it out and it's ready to snap back in every single time you put it snap back in so that's pretty much what we do we explode out the blocks and then once we're up in our flight of running your hamstrings literally as they come down is snapping down and then as your knee goes back you don't want it to so as you as you split you want your knee to come through as quick as possible so you don't necessarily want it to lag back there I know we enjoy this lovely running position of looking lovely, but, you know, you've got to get that knee through. So then what you find is that as your leg is coming down, your knee's already on its way through as both feet are in the air. You know, you're transitioning through. As that strikes down, your knee is next to your knee. So when you're sprinting, you're always looking for this position. So your knee, you want to try and get your knees together as one foot strikes the floor. That mm. one next one already that is one of the best things. So we look at that. We call that a switch. So mm. you all want to try and, and it's one of the hardest things to do in the first few steps out of block start because there is a bit of a gap on one side or whatever, mm. you know, things. But the switch is key. So elasticity, thinking of yourself and being that way will enable you to sort of feel a bit more ready for our event, as you would say. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. That is really cool. Um, do you, uh, just as a quick follow up, and this is something Ashley and I were talking about before, like, are there certain types of stretches that you just don't do? Or are there things mm. that you feel like, oh, this will actually, like, these protocols might actually hurt my elasticity? Okay, so I've never actually gone down a, a path of not doing something because I thought it would hinder me. Because being mobile and having some form of flexibility is good and i can work on that my upper body oh my gosh i could definitely work on a lot of mobility in around my shoulders and because obviously that will give you some form of elegance to your movement pattern right and control now what i would say is that like something like yoga there's certain yoga positions that i can just not do so it would just be more hard work for me in that moment in time then it would be any form of relaxation and stretching. So if you said to me, all right, Harry, so today um, or uh, in two days, we're going to have a competition and today I want you to do some yoga or the day before I want you to do yoga, that's not going to do me any good because it's more of a stressor to me mm. than it is a form of relaxation. So if you do something, if that works for you and it is a form of relaxation and you're fine to be in those positions, then that's okay. Whereas for me, that wouldn't work. However, if you just said to me, we're going to factor yoga into your training program and it's something that you're going to get better at, that's fine. Something that I do like to do though, I like to do Pilates. So I've been on the Pilates reform a lot. I've, um, I suffered, I suffered, I've got three stress fractures in my back. Mm. Um, so today is still here. My first one was in 2006, seven. I was in a back brace for a year. Um, I suffered with a lot of hamstring injuries from that because obviously that, um, that central chain, 
Mm-hmm. Um, and then I sort of went to Pilates to help me engage my core and find mm-hmm. myself in a better position. Um, and yeah, so that's something, again, not quite flexibility, more conditioning and control, mm-hmm. but there's aspect, again, kinesthetic feel, understanding your body. So to answer your question, obviously I'm meant to be quick about it. Would I do something that is bad for me before competition? No. Would I do something that's stressing me before competition? No. But however, if you said two days before competition, got a rest day the next day, do some Pilates, sure, because I'm used to that and that works for me. So yeah, yeah. just you just got to factor it in around things. That's cool. You're not doing three minute split holds every day? Oh my gosh, I wish I could, right? <laughs> that probably wouldn't be too helpful. Oh man. Um, well, well, Sarah, I was going to say, well, Sarah and Emily in the YouTube chat think your explanations on mechanics and everything else have been great. And uh, if you aren't a coach already, they think you should sign up to be one. So you got fans. You got fans, Harry. I appreciate that. Um, coaching, co- I, do you know what? I would take the, t- I would take the role as consultant. Hmm. Reason why I would take role of consultant is because you get to dip in and dip out, right? It's like being an <laughs> uncle. It's like you can play with your niece or nephew, and then when they start to cry, you just hand them back. Give you back. Because <laughs> this is why everyone should appreciate their coaches so much more. And if anything, just make sure at the end of each week, you just say, coach, I appreciate you. Because coaching is a 24-hour job. These guys, you know, you're thinking about you know, programs, sessions, recovery, how's this person sleeping, what what are they up to? It's a full-time job. And, you know, my coach is Swedish. She works for our federation. And I feel it. But the problem is, you know, I could call him at 8.30 at night and say, hey, um, you know, I've been thinking about blah, blah, blah. And he's going to take that call because he's got that responsibility to me. Whereas, you know, I've got an eye for sprinting and I love the concept of helping people. And I enjoy giving people those big jumps. Now, do I think I've got the capacity to be that person 24-7? I don't know yet. You know? And where you transition through that being a selfish athlete because everything's about you to, hang on, I want to take my time out and make sure and then enjoy their process and enjoy their journey with them and and embody that. So I've I've sort of wavered through that process. Yeah. For sure. Well, long career ahead. So we'll see where things go. Um, we want to get into, Ashley and I wanted to get into strength training after this, but let's, we want to do a quick commercial break first, just to remind you all the, the Together We Move program and uh, of our awesome giveaway with New Balance. Actually, thank you to New Balance for bringing Harry on to today's show. What is the giveaway, Ashley? What can they win? Yes. So you can receive a pair of New Balance 880s, cult classic, amazing training shoe. It's one of my favorites. I have been wearing it for years. Um, and a year-long membership to the Run Experience app. So two lucky winners, you have to be present to win. And when we announce your name at the end of the show, you need to write a little comment so that we know that you're here. Exactly, and remember that link is in the description of this video you can find and enter. Um, So Harry, we wanted to talk about strength training, and we were talking about this a little bit before we got on the show, But, but generally when we look at distance runners, it seems, this isn't true for everyone, but it seems generally that distance runners take a defensive approach with strength training. It's like, <laughs> ah, I'm a little nervous about this. I don't want to get hurt, but I'm doing this to just prevent injuries. That's all. And usually the weights are a little bit lighter. It's just everything is just less aggressive. But yeah, if I scroll your Instagram channel, <laughs> which I was doing earlier, you're like, oh man, this dude knows how to train. And I wanted to know if all sprinters take a more you know, offensive approach to strength training and just what that is like for you. Yeah, like obviously when you look at what being a sprinter is about, I grew up watching Maurice Green, you know, the guy was licking his lips, walking back and forth, but most importantly, he had the pecs, he had the shoulders, he had that physique and that is an image that most people do sort of associate with being a sprinter so most most of us know that we will end up doing weights but half the reason is we don't know why that's one of the big questions you have to ask i would always say to any youngster you know if you look at me and you're like i want to be big like harry i'm going to ask you why because if i was to tell you at age 13 i had pecs you'll say what if i was to tell you that i had this physique when i was 20 You'd say how? And I never lifted up until I was 21, right? So the approach that we 
have is con- from a conditioning perspective, right? So we aim to condition first. So from that sprinting, once you get past the, I want to bench press, and I, I, I bench maybe once once every two months or once every three months. I very rarely bench. I'm not allowed to in case, you know, I do get a bit swole. Um, the, the sort of approach to it is, again, it's conditioning. That's how you need to think of it. It's conditioning first, and then it's appreciating and developing power and strength. Mm. Now, again, you have to ask yourself, why are you doing something? And then how are you going to do it? Mm. So for me, mindset changed when I was just power cleaning. Um, I wanted to just get to the 100 club. I just wanted to power clean 100 kilos. So that's, what's that? Um, two, two, 220, 220 pounds. 220 pounds, two, yeah. Two, two plates. I just wanted to power clean two plates. Now for me, I just wanted to do it. I didn't know why. I didn't know why it helped me. I just wanted to do it. Once I got an appreciation as to why it would help me, yeah, we do a lot of power cleans. That is an association with the starting blocks, pushing out, exploding out of the blocks. Mm. That whole movement is all about the first couple steps. That's about it, really. And it is increasing strength. Now, once I started to appreciate and understand that, my technique and development for that specific exercise, it, it went skyrocketed through the roof. I can power clean 170 kilos, yeah. that is in pounds. So someone can times that by 2.2 for me, and you can let everyone know. <laughs> I think it's nearly 400 pounds maybe, yeah. or yeah. it's over 400 pounds, but yeah. Yeah, so, for, the, for those of you who don't know what a power clean is, it's a, a bar that starts on the ground, and you get into a basic deadlift shape, and you're trying to jump this weight up to your shoulders, and your arms are pretty darn straight, so it's a huge explosive leg movement but so much happens through the midline because it has to really support it and then you have to get underneath it and, and move quickly so it's it's a technical lift but very very explosive and it seems like you really liked it when you connect it with a certain aspect of your specific sport exactly and the reason why was how do you just explain it as you're down in that position with the bar rather than just trying to get it up you're thinking actually i need to activate through my glutes i need to keep my chest up is that not too similar from my feet being in the blocks and actually putting the pressure on my back block and also pushing from both feet yes hang on and then do i not need to triple extend like i'm extending with my back leg as my right leg goes forward and then my left leg goes back is that not any form of triple extension yes so then you start to figure these things out and then also is is also about keeping dynamic so a lot of people ask me you lift heavy or you mm. can lift heavy, right? I've never excelled. So I've never gone to a point where I think that this is it. This is the best I'll ever lift in my life. Because in terms of when I would, you know, creep up to those sort of weights, I was only really lifting 130 kilos, which again, I think is like 256 pounds yeah. or like yeah, that. Around, yeah, so I was lifting those sort of weights. But what I make a point of doing, I make a point of lifting it well and fast. So my my perspective is I'm trying to do this quicker. So it's like wearing any form of sled or weighted vest. Mm -hmm. So if this is holding you back, you're now trying to get through rather than just uh, upping the load. Get good at what you're doing. Get good at that movement. Get good at making something feel easy. And then you might think, okay, I'll approach this. Because with the power cleans, how quickly or how smooth you can get the bar off the floor. Mm. You can't struggle with that thing. It's got to fly up. Mm-hmm. Similar with, I front squat. Um, I can front squat 200 kilos. Uh, so again, over four, whatever, 420, 450. Four, four, yeah. yeah, 450, something yeah, four, four, stupid. Ever. <laughs> so I, can, I can front no squat big deal. But again, my transition into it is 150, 160 getting comfortable moving at that because when you think about sprinting is being comfortable moving at those mm-hmm. speeds and then what i would also do if something's too slow because again it's not about training slower tissues we're not training for hypertrophy specific hypertrophy specifically we're training to activate the muscle to run fast and grow in that capacity i would superset it with a box jump single leg box jump mm. double box jump because you want to keep that activation so if i'm doing a slow squat I then go over to a box jump, and now I've got to move fast. So yeah. you're losing the fatigued muscle, but it's still moving fast. Yeah, you have that and force the, production and then power right next to it. Yeah. yeah exactly. 
how is the word? Because there's been strong, but I'm not trying to push a car down a road. I'm trying to I'm trying to smash through the car and be done with it in two seconds. You know, it's just boom and done. So there's different ways. I, I just find the mindset around what you're doing in the gym. And again, this might help some of the distance runners out there because it's not just, oh, I don't want to put on muscle size or I don't want to fatigue my system. These are all conditioning aspects that can help you become stronger. Condition your tendons, condition your muscles. And again, it can help you be more mobile and also understand your body more because that kinesthetic approach to how you're feeling, that transverse plane of cr as you're lifting a weight, all of these things, if you can't lift up your own body weight as a human being and you class yourself as a fit person, then, you know, are you, you know, just be good, Ooh. be athletic. This is the reason why <laughs> we Garland do. Garland has been track. thrown. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the thing that you said earlier too, like um, you were stressing like this specificity of what you're doing and that everything has a purpose. And so when you go to do an exercise for everyone listening, like, why are you doing yeah. what? Why are you doing it? What is it for? And and understanding that connection between your whole body. Yeah. So but I but I want to poke on this this specificity <laughs> thing because I've seen it show up in our comments and it's something we talk about all the time. Like I, as a coach, I've seen this for a long time. You know, runners be like, I want the run specific strength mm. program. Yeah. And if I worked with them and then I worked with a set of skiers beforehand, I'm like, am I teaching them how to squat differently? Is it the same yeah. squat or am I yeah. just trying to get them to relate it? To something else because like the principle of the power like clean mm -hmm. would probably be the same and if you were a cyclist i could liken the bottom position of your power clean to your cycling position how you mm -hmm. are on yeah. the bike right mm -hmm. so it's yeah. so i want to think about it is like is it really specific training or is the specificity coming in our mental application and association i definitely think it's more so in the mental application of because so I'm not too sure if you're aware of uh, some form of like coach called Franz Bosch. He's done like a fair amount of work in regards to the body, mm. you know, sort of regulating itself in ways that it always solves a problem. And my coach does some of the most maddest things. And, you know, you get a little bit of track embarrassment when you're having to do. So I might be doing, you know, like dribbles or bleeds and I have a five kilo disc. And then I'll take the disc around my head this way and I'll take the disc around my head th that way. And it is just, again, to activate and cause your body to throwing it into different environments so that it corrects itself and understands itself. Mm. Now, that's, that's as specific as you can get. Mm. So when we're talking about what you're doing in the gym or uh, strength training, we're all talking about all forms of conditioning mm -hmm. and productivity for your sport. So, you know, if, if, if you were to come to me as a sprinter or distance runner there's more things that you can do e even if you're thinking about fatiguing elements there's more things that you can do as an iso movement you know as opposed to having to actually contract your muscles in a certain sense you can do more isometrics mm -hmm. to to cause any form of stability and uh, and uh, strengthen your achilles for example that's something that a lot of people struggle with at a certain point um there's a lot of things that i would say that people need to explore but still, always ask the question why. It's okay to ask why and mm -hmm. to learn. You can only you can only absorb what what is what is given to you, but you have to ask the question as to why. And it's always good to pick brains. It's always good. And you also said, and get to know your body better, which is yeah. such a huge one because when we think about everything, every part of our body being connected from our head to our toes, it's also that psychosomatic connection too of yeah. like mind and body. So yeah. all of those elements. Ashley um, was, she's probably going to have mixed feelings about me sharing this on feed, but she was just telling me how she's taking Tai Chi oh, earlier today. Yeah. Really <laughs> she was like, where is he going with this? <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Tai Chi is so cool because it's all about this balance between tension and, rela and, and relaxation, basically. I think it's called, someone in there who maybe knows Tai Chi better, it's Pong and Song, I think. It's like the tension and then the relaxed portion. So with, like when you're talking about sprinting and you're in your race and there's this level of tension with every step, but there's also that relaxation. So, um, yeah, Are there the balance. Breathing, breathing methods with this then or. Yes. Um, I am early in my Tai Chi training, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna claim anything yet, but it's cool. <laughs> like okay. This rapid fire questions really quickly because we have some that we want to ask you that have nothing to do with anything that we've talked about so far. Okay. I'm okay. Ready. Okay. Um, I'll start. Should I? I'll start. Yeah. Why don't you start, Ashley? Okay. 
Um, what's your favorite TV show? Rick and Morty. <laughs> um, uh, we hear you love video games. What are your three favorites? My three favorite video games would be, number one at the moment is FIFA, being British. I love soccer, as you guys would call it. Um, and then I'm a big fan of Grand Theft Auto. I should, probably shouldn't admit that. Um, and then and thirdly, I've never really got to a third game. Those two games have always just stayed in my console for as long as I can remember. Um, what is, okay, this is a little bit related to what we've talked about. What is one form drill that you always do? Mm. Uh, bleeds, like dribbles. Um, I always, always do them. Um, they mirror a lot of that, like we were talking about, that kinesthetic feel mm -hmm. um, of hitting the track, dorsiflexing your toes, moving your arms and adding that cadence and frequency along the track. I really enjoy that. What's a good 100 meter time for 14 year olds? Oh, well, put it this way. When I was, so it's, it's broken now, but when I was 14, I ran 10.83. Now this was a European age best record. So that that's like obviously creme de la creme. So anywhere in around, 11 seconds, if you can get sub, amazing, but 11 seconds to 11.4, I would say is a really good time for a 14-year-old boy. As for a female, um, I'm not too sure, but I feel like if you could hit in and around 11.9, 12 seconds, you're in a good region. That's good. Uh, nice. What is the, we kind of got into this earlier, but uh, talking about the different length races you've run, but have you ever run a mile all out? How'd it go? No. I don't think I don't think I have the furthest I've kind of gone. Wait, have I? I might have done without knowing. I re I think I'm. <laughs> yeah, I have. I have done. But okay, how did that happen? <laughs> yeah, I I did because I did it the other day. But I ran for about eight minutes and I yeah I I covered a mile. Um, I my coach has actually factored in some form of running in my program, and um yeah so at the end of my sort of back to backs I had a eight minute run. And I, yeah, I covered, yeah, I was over 2K. So yeah, I covered them all. So you're, you, you have more running incorporated into your training right now because of the current situation or what does that look like? Yeah. So again, it's just an aspect of just trying to keep us fit and ticking mm -hmm. over. So mm -hmm. it's, it, it is not something that I would usually do, but then at the same time, the thing at the word, the word that I would use at the moment is intensity. Mm -hmm. When you train, there's a level of intensity that sends you into another ballpark and level of adaptation. If that level of intensity isn't there, then sometimes it's harder to keep that physical fitness or physical sharpness. Mm -hmm. So my mm -hmm. coach things that we might not usually do just to try and add a bit more bulk to it or to fluff the program a bit more mm -hmm. to just make sure that the CV system is still working because, you know, normally I would be doing, you know, two fifties right now, or I'd be, uh, I would have just come back from the States actually having done a warm weather camp. Uh, but we'd have a bit more um, competition, competing mm -hmm. against each other in training. We'd be running faster, longer, and that little quality of training and intensity would take us above and beyond. Whereas mm -hmm. we don't have that, mm -hmm. so we're just blocking it with a bit more. Okay, so I have to ask you what your favorite thing to cook is since we know you like to cook. Um, so, okay. Um, if I make a really nice, I can do a good steak, that's standard, good steak, but I do enjoy cooking a, it's sort of like a sort of Caribbean kind of coconut chicken rice dish that goes down really nicely, bit of coconut milk, some chopped tomatoes, season the chicken up, that goes in the oven, it comes in a little bit later, you know, all of that sort of stuff, nice bit of can do your coconut rice, can do your rice and peas, whatever you fat. See, I'm a feeder. My wife hates it because I constantly feed her. Um, I also like to bake. My favorite thing that I like to bake is a chocolate fondant. So, you know, the thing that, that melt out the middle, the chocolate. Yeah. That's, oh, yeah. Yeah. If you, I, I'm at, And again, I asked myself the other day, have I smiled enough today? So at 9.30 at night, I said, no, I haven't smiled enough today. So I made myself a chocolate fondant. <laughs> <laughs> That's so great. Yeah. Um, Such good advice for everyone. Really, really good. Time. Like, um, if you get to 9 30 at night and you say you haven't smiled enough, make yourself a cake or do something to make you laugh. I love <laughs> That's it. it.
<laughs> I love it. It's so good. So guys, we are ready to do the uh, the drawing to see who wins these Austin New Balance shoes and training from us. Uh, Ashley, do you want to do one more? Question? Uh, one more question. I'll yes. pull up. Do you I'll pull want up, to do a question? I kind of do. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I uh, thought you had one in mind when you were asking. <laughs> well, I kind of do, but then I was like, oh, maybe I'll give it to Ashley while I'm looking up the things. But if it's my question, what I'm going to ask <laughs> is, do you consider training to be play or work? Mm, that's a good one. Oh, so it's definitely play. And that's just my my philosophy on it. So, like, I, I wish I could show you um, my fridge, which is literally, literally like, right there at all my fridge. I have a list of things that, like, I want it in life. I see it. I believe it. I kind of, like, keep that. And something that I always have a mantra of is never let something you love become a chore. Mm. And a happy athlete tends to be a fast athlete. A happy person tends to be a successful person. When you're in that moment of, you know, enjoying what you do, the pressures tend to be a little bit less and the enjoyment is more now obviously this is my job it pays my bills it's what something that you know there's there's stressful aspects around it so it's quite easy to get clouded with a lot mm -hmm. of things there's been times where i've woken up and been like oh i really can't be bothered to train or i don't want to train but i sit and then i ask myself hang on but why am i feeling like this because this is something that i love and sport is, without being funny, all of us that partake in any form of hobby or sport is a luxury in life. There's a lot of people in, in, in life that don't have time or can't afford or are born into unfortunate circumstances. So we're very lucky to be doing these things. So I've got to ask myself, why, why, am, I, why am I not wanting to do this? And you pick out those little things that are causing you to feel that way. And it might be because of financial issues. It might be because you want to impress that person. It might be because you're, and then you find, hang on, I don't like that coach or I don't like that training with that person. Or I don't. And then once you remove those things, then you go back to the enjoyment factor. So that's one of the things that I'm doing right now. So my Instagram lives that I've been doing with the workouts, I'm, I'm finding that I've lost my banterful enjoyment. You know, I'll be playing music when I train and dancing. I like to vibe with people. I'm a people person. So let me put mm -hmm. myself in a situation that will have that enjoyment. I want to feel like I'm training in a high performance center. So I'm redecorating my garage and making that some form of, you know, confined space for me to train in and feel that way. I'm going to do things that allow me to feel like I'm having fun and enjoying what I do. I'm very lucky to have earned any form of currency for running. Ten I run from a gun. I hear a gun and I run. Some people do that where they live and they don't get paid for that. So I'm very lucky to do that. So I always think of it as play. Yeah, what a what a what an answer, man. I mean, any anyone can have their own perception on it. Some people need to be a bit more aggressive, some people need to be a bit more this is work. And you can be obsessed. It's okay to be obsessed with your sport, but just remember it's fun. Winning is fun. It's it's fun to run, it's fun to do the sport that you, you think about and dream about. And enjoy it. It's, it's fun. That's what you've got to remember. Yeah. Really uh, good advice. So our winners are Nancy uh, Ledesna. Uh, and I think she's here. So congratulations, Nancy, from Elk good Grove, job, California. Nancy. And Thanks. our original winner, Abe, uh, was not here. So we are going with Adam Lickin, Lickin from Urbandale, Iowa. So congratulations, okay. Adam and Nancy, on uh, not only winning the New Balance shoes, but an annual membership of training with us. So we are excited to get you in there. Um, so good. Um, Harry, you have been such a pleasure to talk with. This has been so great. Man. This is awesome. I, I feel like that. I'm leaving the show with renewed motivation myself. I, I know. I want to go make a chocolate cake now and film. <laughs> and laugh. <laughs> this is it. This is what it's about. But seriously, thanks for having me on. Um, it's been great to, you know, just chat and vibe and 
talk about certain things and I really appreciate you guys and you know the the energy is positive and I really appreciate that also of course if if um you know all of these runners want to follow you uh where can they connect with you Instagram is my main form of social my main social platform that I sort of put a lot of myself on um it's my handle is just Aiken so it's a i k i n e s um, I'll be doing a live workout tomorrow at 1 p.m. UK time. So whoever's four or five hours behind, maybe six hours behind, you can jump in that. Um, but yeah, so Instagram is where I'm at. And then hopefully you'll be seeing me Tokyo 20, 2021 instead of 2020, 2021. Um, yeah, repping GB. I love it. Well, I know I'm going to be jumping in some of your uh, live trading. That sounds like uh, a whole lot of fun. I appreciate you guys. You guys are doing a lot for the community. And I feel like, you know, an applause goes out to you guys because you're doing it, you're living it, you're breathing it, and you're talking about it. So shout out to you sure. guys. Well, excellent. Well, guys, thank you so much for our live show this week. Uh, stay tuned. In. We got something special dropping on Sunday, Ashley, don't we? We do. Yes. Do you want me to start? <laughs> oh, you froze for a minute. I was like, he's frozen. I don't oh, know no. if he's talking. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing a fitness test on Sunday to see where you are right now with your fitness, whether you've been joining us for this entire Together We Move training or you're joining us right now. We have four exercises, mm -hmm. four activities for you to do to see where you're at. That's right. We're going to be testing your strength, your mobility and range of motion, that core stability, and of course, your endurance and stamina, your ability to suffer and to run which is just gonna be so much fun. And it's, it's gonna take probably less than 30 minutes. So it is not gonna take long at all. And uh, it's going down Sunday, guys. So stay tuned for that. And uh, everyone else, have a good Friday. Ashley, enjoy the weekend. Harry, thank you Harry. again. And uh, we'll see you guys online. Bye, y'all.